Hello and welcome to our first Governor Conference. It's wonderful to have you join us and we hope that you'll find the multitude of sessions we have on over the coming week enjoyable, interesting and informative. My name is Hannah Stoughton and I'm the Chief Executive here at Governors for Schools. For those who are visually impaired, we will be sharing a brief audio description of ourselves. I'm chairing today's panel and I'm female, white British, mid 40s with short brown hair and glasses. We're delighted to have the support of so many partner organisations and such a great variety of speakers. We're grateful to all of them for giving their time, their insight and expertise. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the volunteers and schools we're working with. Despite its challenges, in the last academic year, we've seen over 2000 of our volunteers appointed as governors on either maintained or local governing boards and a further 89 appointed as trustees. A handful of these governors have been appointed as remote governors They'll continue to support schools outside of their local area in the coming years. And we look forward to hearing how this new way of working continues and placing more people into that sort of role. I'd also like to thank the businesses and universities we work with who promote us to their employees and those who support us financially. Foundations, individuals and corporate partners, we really couldn't do it without you. Last September, we launched our Wellbeing Governors campaign. We have a session later in the conference that reinforces that work. And on Friday, we're launching our new campaign, All Pupils, Every Ambition. Do join us for that session if you can. After what has been an extremely challenging 18 months for all those involved in education, we're keen to look forward to what's next. And that's why we decided to run this conference. We've all learned so much in that time, not least just how much of a foundation the education system provides to all of our communities. In this first month of the school year, I'm sure you'll all be thinking about what to keep and what to change. Hopefully these sessions will provide plenty of food for thought. For our first session, we'll be looking at a topic that will resonate with all governors and schools, how we can continue to leverage technology to best support our schools. Before I introduce our panelists, a few housekeeping notes. Closed captions are available. Uh, you just need to click on the live transcript button at the bottom. As I said, speakers have been invited to share a short verbal description of themselves. The chat function is disabled, but you can put any questions you have in the Q&A panel. I'll then try and field those questions to our panelists at the end of the session. The session is being recorded and links to the video and further resources will be sent out. Please continue to follow the conference over the course of the week, liking and sharing any content and our hashtag is GFSConference21. Finally, at the end of the session, you'll be uh, provided with a short post-session survey. So without further ado, we have four speakers joining us today. We hope we're missing one at the moment, but hopefully he'll be arriving soon. First of all, we have Neil Collins. Neil is the founder and director of Governor Hub. It's an online tool which incorporates the SharePoint site specifically for governors, but it does so much more than just store documents. Then we have Dean Lindsay. Dean is Customer Marketing Manager at 8x8. He helps organisations digitally transform to improve user experiences. Kathy Inskip is the Chair of Trustees at Ashfield Single Academy Trust. She initially was appointed as a Community Governor. Ashfield is a special school based in Leicester for 160 pupils with physical disabilities, often with complex medical needs. Finally, we have James Garnett. James is the Director of IT at United Learning Academy Trust. He's currently leading the EdTech Demonstrator Programme on behalf of the DfE. So I'll now hand over to you, Neil. Thanks, Hannah. As Hannah said, I'm, uh, my name's Neil Collins. I'm Director at Governor Hub and The Key. Governor Hub is now part of The Key Support Services. I'm male, white British, glasses, slightly growing hair, I'm, I'm sad to say, but uh, uh, slightly past middle age. Just move on to next slide, please. So, in terms of tech in education, then the key trend is is the move to the cloud. Um, we've we've seen this for the last um, ten to fifteen years, but it's really great gathering a pace. So, I thought actually, as a as a tech company, I'd just give you a bit of insight into why that makes a lot of sense, particularly for tech companies. So, the first is um, development costs. So if you're uh, someone with a great ed tech idea um, and you want to actually roll it out, having to send materials to 
thousands of schools is a huge cost. Whereas distributing it via the cloud, you can do uh, mu a much lower cost, you can scale much more quickly. And we definitely saw this with Governor Hub. So we launched Governor Hub in 2012, developed it on the Google Cloud platform with storage using Amazon uh, documents. And that it makes the software development considerably easier. And also as we scale up, so we're now used by about 9,000 schools, um, we can just tweak up the server capacity and it's a, 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 a very simple process. There are no challenges with that. If I turned my webcam around and looked out the window, you'd see a nice rural setting in, in Norfolk. But that brings a lot of challenges for schools like the ones near me in rural locations without really good broadband. So one of the things I think which is going to be a key factor in a lot of schools, in particular a lot of small schools, is ensuring that as you bring in cloud technology, bringing in cloud software, you also have the necessary broadband access um, to, to do that. Can you go to the next slide, please? And governance is very much uh, moving to the cloud. Um, I'll just share a story we found when we went into lockdown a few years ago uh, with Governor Hub. One of the things we recognized at the time was that meetings would have to be virtual, they would have to go online. And we uh, spent some time working with a partner in the US to develop a video conferencing solution. We got this out in amazingly quick time, about, uh, in about a month. But actually, the thing that really surprised us was that during that month, the whole sector pivoted pretty much to do meetings online. So people adopted Teams, Zoom, Google Meet, and a variety of others. So in fact, we never launched our video conferencing capabilities because it wasn't needed. The market um, overtook us. And I think it's, it's quite stark to notice that that level of transition can happen actually very quickly in a market which isn't necessarily uh, renowned for its uh, quick moving or, or, or uh, technology adoption. We think actually probably in terms of introducing video meetings to governance. We probably saw about uh, five years advance in a matter of a few weeks. It was astonishing. But also like to share some of the things we also saw on, uh, on, on Govern Hub during lockdown. One of the things is that uh, meeting attendance on average went up by one person per meeting. Now, given that it was quite an uncertain time for governance, we actually expected it to go the other way. We, we, we thought meeting attendance would drop, but no, it, it was uh, on average going up. So what we think is happening there is that because the meetings were um, virtual, it meant that um, they were more accessible to a lot of governors. So those governors trying to fit in a meeting at the start or the end of a work day, for example, or those who had, um, restrictions in terms of travel could more easily access the meetings and therefore overall the attendance went up. So that was very interesting. The other thing we've seen from the, uh, from the data is that on average, um, governors are spending 25% more time online. So the average session on Govern Hub has, has extended. And again, I think that's uh, an indicator that more of the work of governors is moving um, from paper to online. So one thing that we have heard time and again from uh, our customers around the country is that um, even as lockdown restrictions go away, governor meetings are likely to be in some sort of mixed mode where you've got a number of um, a number of attendees in person in the classroom, but also some connecting in remotely. Uh, it's quite a challenge. I've chaired quite a few of those meetings, and they're quite difficult to chair. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting mix, an interesting dynamic. But it also opens up a few opportunities. So, for example, um, we've just appointed a trustee on our multi academy trust trust board, and um, I chair who 
is it is not local so they're, they're actually going to be connecting in from london and uh, the use of technology opens up that capability um uh, my ceo within my trust um, is using the video capabilities to drop into local governing board meetings around um, the schools within our trust and that's not something that would be particularly feasible pre previously because it would um, as I say we're in rural Norfolk so traveling from the office to the school would take a take an hour there and then an hour back and to give a five minute update is uh, not particularly great, a great use of his time but now we can just drop in for a short segment and then uh, leave so that, I think in terms of communications around the trust as well that helps uh, that helps enormously so I think so in conclusion, I think what we'll see in all of our schools is more use of cloud resources, uh, and that will continue as uh, new solutions come out. And you'll also see, particularly within governance, um, an accelerated move uh, from paper to online meetings and online resources. Um, and that's echoed both within um, individual boards but also how those boards will access resources so for example training around the country has largely moved online for uh, for governor training some of that will come back face to face as will meetings but a lot of that will still stay online so yes i think a lot of governance will be done just like we are this morning via video and hannah I'll hang back to you Thanks very much. so much, Neil. Thank you. That's great. Excellent overview of, of where we are. Um, we'll hand, hand over to Cathy now. Uh, Cathy, if you're ready to, to talk. Hopefully Dean will be able to join us in the meantime. Thank you, Hannah. Sorry, I'll just wait for the slides to come up. Thank you. Um, just a, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm female. I am white British. Um, um, I'm in my late 50s, sadly, <laughs> um, and um, hair darkish uh, brown and desperately needs cutting, as I'm sure a lot of people is during this, this period. But, but um, thank you for um, allowing me to join you this morning. Thank you. Um, I've been asked um, just to share a little bit about our experience of working as a a trustee board, um, as Hannah mentioned in the introduction, I'm the chair of Ashfield Academy, which is a single academy trust. Um, so just wanted to share a little bit about our experience. I'm sure some of this would um, resonate with, with other governors. Don't think we did anything special. We found our way through this, as I'm sure many boards did. Um, and actually a, a few of the bits I just wanted to, to, to mention actually reflect the, the same comments that, that Neil has just made. Um, I've then got just a couple of slides also um, at the end, just to talk a little bit about our remote learning offer, offer that we provided to pupils um, uh, through the, um, the last couple of years. Um, but if I begin, um, just as Anna said, we're a, a special school for 160 pupils. The primary uh, need is a significant physical disability, um, often um, alongside um, complex and long-term medical needs. So for our pupils and families throughout this period, um, we've obviously been concerned about pupil health and pupil wellbeing and, and family health. And that's affected quite significantly, um, certainly the remote learning officer uh, offer, and I'll mention that later. But in terms of how we've worked as a um, trustee board during this period, um, Neil mentioned Teams, and that's the, the route that we took to hold virtual meetings. We maintain the same structure, so we have our trust board and we hold one um, additional committee. Um, and throughout the, the last couple of years, I'm sure as many boards, we've held a number of additional meetings, mainly as single um, meetings to review the, the COVID-19 risk assessment and the staff guidance that we've provided throughout this, this period. Um, making an obvious statement really, but the focus of our um, board meetings has been around safeguarding and health and safety. Um, 
to ensure that we've always maintained sort of pupil staff wellbeing and working with parents as, as key standing agenda items that have hopefully um, helped us to make the decisions that, that we have. Where possible, we've tried to continue with business as usual. That's been difficult at times through our board meetings. But fortunately, our school improvement um, plan that we had in place um, already had priorities in relation to pupil and staff wellbeing and working with parents. So in, in many ways, we've been able to continue with some of that direction of travel, um, which has been fortunate for us. Obviously, as we've been meeting virtually, um, whilst we've had lots of opportunities to find out how to work together in through that forum, what we've missed desperately is that that much more direct and informal contact that we would, would have had with the staff team and pupils if we'd been on site as we normally, normally are for our trustee board meetings. So we've had to think through how we still maintain that contact um, we've had good representation not only from the principal but other senior leadership team um, staff at our meetings and we've also tried to establish some direct contact meetings with staff over teams so for example myself and another trustee met with with staff five teams to um, talk about safeguarding in school during this period we felt that was really important to not only hear how um, those things have been implemented differently as needed by the principal, but to understand that from the staff perspective as well, so that we try to get a 360 degree view on, on that. Um, I believe that was received well by the staff team in terms of us trying to, to maintain that direct contact with them. We've also, as I'm sure many boards or all boards have done, is tried to make sure that we've sent letters and emails to staff throughout this period to thank them and to recognise the, the contributions they've all been making and, and the same to, to pupils. Neil, I, I think mentioned that, that what we've certainly kind of um, experienced is that we've been uh, undertaking kind of an increased, increased amount of time of reviewing documentation outside of the, the, the trustee meetings um, and perhaps had a, a kind of closer online link between ourselves as a group throughout, throughout the, the last couple of years. Um, next slide, please. Again, I'm sure nothing that, that others aren't, aren't sort of experiencing. And certainly when we were reviewing the DFE School Trust Governance during COVID-19 uh, report that came out in, in um, August, um, I think um, we, we felt the same in terms of a number of the, what we felt as the benefits and the challenges. So we felt some of the benefits of working in this way had, the, had been that it, at times it had really enabled us to keep our discussions focused. Um, and I guess partly because of the virtual um, meeting, but also just um, because of, of working through this period, we do feel that, that we further strengthened the relationships with the staff team who have been able to attend the board meetings with us. Um, and again, as Neil mentioned, um, for some governors, it, it has meant a reduced travel time and being able to join us remotely um, has actually meant for one trustee who no longer is, is um, working in Leicester, where we're based, that um, we were concerned, concerned potentially about losing him. But that's this way of working as and, and will continue in that way to attend virtually. So for us, in terms of retaining his skill set, that's been a real positive. Um, the challenges, I think, key for us, as, as mentioned just previously on the last slide, has been that opportunity to be present in school. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just still on the bottom of the last slide. Um, just that opportunity to be um, um, on site with people being able to do that monitoring. Um, so, for us, I think Neil mentioned it. Um, we are looking at how we move forward in a, with a blended approach and trying to take the, the, the kind of positives out of being on site, also having the opportunity to meet virtually, but um, very much feeling that, that we want to be back on site amongst the school community to undertake our role uh, most effectively. I think we also felt for some of the challenges was it was more difficult 
focus on the longer term strategy. Not sure if it was actually because of needing to meet um, virtually or whether it was because the demands of the period has been about quite often um, being much more reactive and responsive to short term needs um, and being flexible to, to the things that were happening um, for the school um, on a day to day basis. Some trustees felt that this was limited part around people's confidence in using technology, people's preferred style of, of communication. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, the additional time outside of meetings has increased in terms of reading that documentation and, and the guidance. So as you'd expect, a range of views across trustees, benefits and, and, and challenges, but, but hopefully moving forward, it's trying to take those things that we feel are positive and blend them with the previous ways of, of working and, and particularly being on site at the school. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Just wanted to say a little bit, a little bit about our remote learning offer. Again, just bearing in mind for us as a school, um, 160 pupils all have education, healthcare plans. So um, much of our learning with school is bespoke, very personalised, very much a sensory curriculum. Um, and so it's quite difficult to replicate that outside of the, the school environment. Um, we have high um, think support for pupils um, linked to their education healthcare plans. So obviously we were very aware that in terms of that level of support, the impact on parents at home to be able to, to support their, their son or daughter with their remote learning. So our remote learning officer, uh, the learning offer has been very much about both um, having a remote learning team led by the principal, but we also set up a dedicated support team from within the staff um, to ensure that there was regular contact with parents um, to support not only them, but also to support them in terms of delivering that learning um, at home. We already have an education outreach support officer in post um, to support those pupils aside from any impact of COVID who perhaps because of their complex needs are, um, are may have periods where they're not well enough to actually be in school anyway. So certainly for us moving forwards, that way of working, that support for people and for families is something we want to develop further. And we feel that the experience of programming has given us some further understanding of how to deliver that function um, to those pupils. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've had to um, make sure our remote learning offer is quite personalised, quite bespoke to the individual pupil um, because of their complex, complex needs. And I guess that's different in terms of remote learning. After the first main lockdown and a period and closure period, we did um, ask um, parents if they'd be willing to complete the test so that we could evaluate the remote learning offer. And through that, again, have been able to um, further improve, hopefully, what, what we've been able to do. For us, certainly before, and certainly reinforced throughout, that for, for us as school to best support schools, um, we must be committed and are a multi agency a partnership working, both with parents, but particular health and social care colleagues that we work closely with. Um, and that being crucial for this, this period. Um, and, and we were really pleased that the school were, were um, asked to contribute to kind of resources in terms of the resources for those pupils with, um, prime, um, with multiple learning disabilities. So that's just a little bit about what we did. Um, if I can move on to the next slide, please. Um, if I've frozen, or can we move on to the next slide, please? Ollie, can you move on?
Don't worry. Sorry. Sit in front of me. No, that's okay. Um, it would just to summarise, really, for, for us, um, just in terms of some key learning and further development points, it, it goes without saying, but I think we, we try to be really explicit throughout this period and continuing about needing to respect and understand the individual context for each trustee. At different times, trustees have had their own, um, possibly their own health issues or within their family uh, situations. And so at different times, different trustees have been able to offer different amounts of time and to take the lead on different areas. And we've felt it's been really important to understand that um, in, in terms of us working most effectively to, to support the school. Goes again without saying, but flexibility we found has, has been what's kept us going throughout this period in terms of recognising that it, we're in ever changing times. And um, one week we may, may think something's the right way forward by the following week, we may have needed to review that um, based on the, the, the sort of information we're receiving from the school. Um, mentioned before about blended approach and, and certainly for us I think that's as, as moving forward that's what we'll be doing um, in terms of virtual meetings but also on-site meetings but, but alongside that certainly for us the, the absolutely essential need for trustee presence um, within the school for our sort of monitoring functions and to have that relationship with pupils and, and staff mentioned again around our education outreach support and, and so for us moving forward very definitely an agenda about further developing our remote learning our resources and approaches to that for pupils going forward who as I say it's not about Covid uh, necessarily but 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 um, have periods of time where they're not able to be present um, due to, to other illnesses and working in partnership um, that's absolutely key for us and um, I do think that we've, we've strengthened our relationships with um, our health and social care colleagues in terms of how we all work to, together going forward. So Hannah that's that's my slides, thank you. Thank you ever so much Cathy, I'm sorry that your, your slides froze there, hopefully um, we can get them back up and running. Uh, we'll I think hand back hand to James now uh, Ollie, can you share the slides while well, the slides are right now? Sorry about that. Not at all, thank you. Thank you so much. See whether we can... While we're sorting that out, I do have a question for you. Did you have any experience of remote parents' evenings, um, the best technology to facilitate this, and any issues to protect staff? Um, yes, we did hold a remote parents' evening. Um, we did that via Teams. We gave some options, so via Teams or via phone calls. And we've also um, run our annual reviews of the EHCPs through mm -hmm. a, um, certainly in the, um, in the first year, through, a, um, through remote, again, or phone calls or, or via Teams. Um, I guess for parents, I think that was quite mixed. So 160 parents and some people feel again that that's a positive way forward and that they found that very effective, maybe because of their time and availability um, or, or maybe their confidence in, in using technology. I think for other parents, they've been very keen to make sure that as soon as they can, they can also be back on site. So at the risk of, of um, sort of giving a vague answer, I, I guess that would be expected in terms of reflecting that that kind of um, range of views across a, you know, that, that number of parents, really. Sure, I understand. Um, I think we've had, we've had a comment that as a chair of a small school in Lincolnshire, they, um, somebody said that they found the ability to call short meetings more rapidly using Teams to discuss immediate needs was fantastic. I think that yes, was a real yeah. benefit, wasn't it, over, over the last year and a half when we have needed to have those emergency meetings sort of to look at risk assessments or whatever it might be. Um, the ability to get everybody together very quickly without them having to travel um, to, to meet in person has been very useful. Hopefully something that we'll continue with in the future. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and okay. like I say, for us, it meant that we've retained the, the, the skills of one of the trustees that we were, um, he didn't want to leave, we didn't want him to leave. So this has made it really possible. So that's a, a huge benefit to us. Lovely. Excellent, thank you. Um, James, can I hand over to you to talk through your slides? Although we seem to be having some problems, I'm afraid. Um, 
I'm sure Ollie's working on it in the background. Are you okay to talk through without sharing them? Not a problem at all. Not Thank a you problem. ever so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is James Garnett. I am white British male, uh, early to mid 50s, glasses, slightly graying hair. Uh, and um, if you could see behind me, you'll see some maps which indicates my, my passion for walking and living near the Peak District as part of that. Um, I am uh, currently Director of IT at United Learning, which is a large multi academy trust, uh, although. Uh, I've parked that role for 12 months while I am program lead for the EdTech Demonstrator Programme, which is a DfE funded programme for schools and colleges in England. Uh, I'm also a school governor and have been for a number of years, both as a teacher governor when I started my career as a teacher and also as a parent governor uh, and uh, regularly uh, when that term comes to an end being co-opted uh, on to stay on the board. Um, although eventually I do get out because I've gone from primary to secondary, um, following my children in many respects. But I love the position and I, I find it a really interesting role to have. Um, so that's about me, about the programme. And, and it's really interesting to, to hear both about cloud technology and infrastructure, which I'll touch on that Neil picked up, uh, and remote lesson and blended learning that Cathy's picked up, because uh, I'll touch on some of those and, and, and how as a governing body you can support your, your schools or trust to, to work with that. So the EdTech Demonstrator Programme is free to all publicly funded schools and colleges in England. And I'd say it's England. Uh, we occasionally get schools from Wales trying to sign up and you, we, we can't support you. And occasionally we get independent schools trying to sign up and again, we can't support them. If you're a trust, you can come on and board as a trust and we can support trusts or you can come on and we can also then support the schools that sit underneath you. Um, up to 30 hours of peer-to-peer -peer or peer-led support really available to any one institution. So it could be 30 hours at trust level, helping trust develop their uh, digital strategy and looking at how they're going to develop uh, their strategy across the whole trust. But then they can also, there's an additional 30 hours per school uh, or academy within that trust that we can also support. Uh, and um, uh, we can also support uh, to, um, Hey, my son's just walked in. What do you want, William? Sorry, the perils of working from home and having teenage children who can't find something. My apologies. Um, so we can also support the individual schools. Uh, and for a number of the uh, people who have signed up for support on the programme, uh, we have, uh, or, or the programme has, worked both at trust level and school level. And we have 42, um, actually 43 really, 43 uh, schools and colleges that provide that peer-led support. Uh, and they are either a small primary school in uh, the North, in the Yorkshire Dales, through to some of the larger academy trusts, some of them are small, medium-sized academy trusts. So there, there, there's a range of um, schools uh, and colleges that are providing that level of support. Uh, and we've just recently signed up National Star uh, who provide uh, support for 16 to 19 year olds uh, for children with, with, with very uh, specific and, and severe needs uh, and life limiting uh, uh, needs. So th there's a range of support there, um, both on Google and on the Microsoft platforms using iPads, Chromebooks, Windows devices, anything you want support on, we can normally uh, find someone to provide support. Uh, and, and I suppose, why do schools need a digital strategy, which is sort of the, the focus for this, because without it, I think schools tend to go down a white elephant route. Now, if we start from the premise that technology and digital tools can support and enhance the effective delivery of education, which I firmly believe in, uh, and I think over the last 12 months, we probably feel that that's true, then we'll need a coherent strategy for ensuring that it delivers on those perceived benefits but in a manner which is costed, affordable, and measured for success and subsequently revised in light of that success. And in a way, that's what enables us as governors to give oversight. You know, if someone comes, to, you know, if, if a school governing a school says we want to buy, you know, want to spend X thousand pounds on a, a, on five trolley suites of, of iPads, you want to know what their plans are for. You want to know how they're going to, you know, how is it going to support education? How is it going to drive improvement? Um, and without it, I think we are almost signing blank checks, checks a lot of the time because you, you're not quite sure what they're going to get from it. Um, and that sort of me, leads me on, on sort of my next slide, which is really technology lets human beings do real things in classrooms and homes around the country and around the country, do things faster, more often, more successfully, with greater insight, 
and to greater depth. And I think that's that's the bit about the greater depth. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, and uh, you know, the greater depth piece is, is really important because you know, if we look at the progress of technology from um, uh, chalkboards to dry whiteboards to uh, overhead projectors through to uh, interactive whiteboards, uh, and now possibly putting the, the, the technology in the hands of, of the teacher through uh, whether the iPads or, or Surface Pros or those sorts of devices where the teacher is now detached from the screen but can still project and write on it. That's a huge change in the way that we, we teach. And, and it, you know, if we work on, well, what is the teacher good at? You know, they're very good at explaining, and that's what you want from a teacher getting across that expert subject knowledge. Then how can technology improve that, make it better, make them better, not necessarily better, but in, enhance their ability to explain? And you sort of, you then start to look at, it, well, if I can explain digitally and I can record my voice, I can record that session and I can then say for the children to look at at home. And for some children, then you may need to look at the explanation two or three times for it to really sit it, bed in. So then you've got the ability to record it, uh, that key modeling piece of what you're doing, and the children can then uh, watch it another time. And in some of the one-to-one -one schools and some of the people who are, are the demonstrators are one-to-one -one schools, they talk about the fact that they record that key modeling part of the lesson. And when the children put their hand up, the first thing is, have you had a look at the recording from the start of the lesson? And you can divert the teachers and the support that is in that classroom to those who really don't understand it, not just those who, you know, their first instincts and put their hand up. So I think it's really clever and, and some really interesting ways of doing it. So you know, next slide, please. So how, how, how can governing bodies help? And, and, you know, I know as a governor, you know, part of our role is, is, is to not to be asked, afraid to ask difficult questions or challenge when something doesn't look right, but also in supporting the school, academy, school college or academy in developing its strategy and in making difficult decisions, especially around budget. And, and that's the key bit. When people say we can't afford technology, my technology is old, but I can't afford to replace it. Often it's because there have been some decisions or difficult decisions that have been avoided at some point, because it, it, it's a hard decision to make about how you spend money. And often, I will see within schools uh, that, that there is, a, we won't replace that this year and we'll leave it a bit longer. Uh, and that all um, is something that, that um, is, is a real concern that you, you end up delaying when you replace your technology and that ends up having a, a severe impact. Um, there is another slide, but I'm concerned that we haven't got it. But anyway, next slide, hopefully we're the right one. Um, so, when in, so when you're in schools and, and certainly when you're back in, um, you know, what can you do to, to look at how technology is being used? And one of the most um, in, best ways of doing it is, is when you're in school, you know, are, you know, not looking beyond, are the children engaged? It's not just they're looking at an iPad, but are they actually engaged? Uh, and, and ask how the technology is helping the teacher to teach and the children to learn, rather than they're just looking at the screen and they must be doing something because they're, they're quiet and they're getting on with something. But actually, what is it doing to help the teachers teach? And the children learn and beyond that you know is the technology reliable uh and you know that may be sitting in the staff room and hearing people say it just doesn't work today or this computer's not working there's lots of stickers on pc saying don't use out of order you know is equipment well used you know, are the ipad trolleys that you as a governing body have signed off for last year is it being used in the classroom because you you know there's, there's an investment in time and money in putting it in place, but is it actually being used effectively? Can we go to the next slide, please? Don't worry about it. Um, uh, and the next thing is, is, you know, are staff making use of the tools at their disposal? You know, if, if they put visualizers in the classroom, are they being used? Have you ever seen them being used? And visualizers are a really clever tool that enables teachers to model what's going on. So you can take a student's book and you can talk through what they've done uh, and, and, you know, um, and praise and, and look at the way this has been written. How else could we maybe write this differently? Uh, or you can model handwriting, you can model solving problems uh, on paper that the children can relate to. The other one, and, and Neil talked about um, the cloud, you know, not being able to ask difficult questions or challenge. Uh, when, when you look at the cloud, you know, are you um, giving staff access to materials so they can work from home? Or are you purely uh, knocking holes in your secure system or source to, to give them access? Or are you leaving them to go, well, when you go home, you can't access anything and therefore they've got to stay and work longer. 
And that has an impact in terms of where, you know, flexible working for teachers. You know, I can finish at three o'clock or 3.30, 4 o'clock when the day finishes. I can pick my children up from school and I can then maybe work at a different time. I can do planning and preparation, maybe from home and then come into school uh, when, when I need to teach. So there's a way of being flexible about that, but you want to use the cloud systems that make it more secure and safer. And as a governing body, we are responsible for the security of the systems. We need to make sure that the data is secure uh, and that we've done enough to make sure that it is. Um, do staff have access to devices they can take home? And, it, and you, you don't want people working on their own devices and accessing data that possibly uh, is da under data protection rules. Have a look around, have a look in cupboards. And I, I talk about digital white elephants. You know, are, is the cupboard full of stuff that you bought two years ago that you thought might last five years and isn't being used? Um, and also looking at tools that maybe schools are, are rarely using. Uh, and just before I finish, you know, what should a digital strategy have in it? Um, and I think within that, it, it, you should talk about technology to support teaching. So how does it make me as a teacher more effective? Support learning, how can we support children to learn? not just in class, but also at home. And that brings in uh, some really challenging bits about the digital divide and who has access at home. Uh, and how do we ensure that children who are at home can access the same sorts of tools that everyone else has got access to? Because there are you know, um, assistive learning tools and, and, uh, for, for children with, with additional needs, but there's also adaptive learning tools that look at what you've learned, what you've got right and wrong and target you with questions. And if you're starting to look at that, then children who've got access to those tools and technologies will make more progress than those that don't. So how do we ensure that if we're providing those tools in general, that all children have got access to it? Uh, support for admin, because the admin staff need also access to that. And we talk about school improvement plans and the ability to access those school improvement plans. Support governance uh, and, and you know, the ability to access government, governance and, and papers and meeting material you know, online, have a look at them, maybe to comment on them online, uh, that enables you to, as, as a governing body, to be more effective outside of meetings as well as in. You want someone who's leading the digital strategy, who's got the uh, ear of the senior leadership team, if they aren't on the senior leadership team, and it's being driven by leadership. Uh, it should be heavily linked to your school improvement plan because digital strategy shouldn't be se separated from it. It should be an in, a, a really integrated part of that. And Neil talked about infrastructure, uh, and infrastructure is such a key part of everything that we do. Uh, and if you can't get that right, then nothing, what, if things don't work very well in the classroom, you've got problems. You want your internet, your backbone, your, your, all your infrastructure you have within school to provide that really safe and secure platform to run all of your uh, tools on. Budgets are, are key to this. And you know, within United Learn, there's been lots of discussion about oh, well, how much money do we set aside for um, technology within school budgets to make sure that it is there to support teaching and learning. And um, I'll move on really just to finish that the, the EdTech demonstrator program is there to support all schools and colleges uh, that are funded by the DfE in England to really address some of these issues. Now, it may well be that you, the starting point is I just want to know how to make more effective use of some of the tools we've got in the classroom. That's all we want to do, first of all. And the program can help with that. Or it might well be I want to start looking at digital strategy. Can you help me? And it will be that. Or it might be, well, partway through a digital strategy, we just need someone to sound off against. And as a school, as this team, they can talk to someone else who's been through that process and they can say, well, you know, what are you doing? How did you do this? How did you overcome this problem? How did you manage the budget? We want to do a one-to-one -one scheme. How did you go about sorting that out? Because I've heard this and this from different parties, but I'm still not quite sure how to do it. And so you have access to people who have already done it, who, who are able to support you, whether it's in the college sector, the secondary sector, the primary sector, or, or, or uh, schools uh, such as Cathy's uh, special schools where, where you have specific uh, additional needs. Uh, there are schools within the program who can help and support through that. It's up to 30 hours uh, and you, you make your decision when you sign up to the program uh, and we'll share the link afterwards uh, when you sign up to the program of uh, getting the right, uh, you know, you have that initial discussion with the demonstrator and they will uh, talk you through maybe you want six hours or 15 hours or 30 hours. It runs up to the end of March next year. Uh, we're hoping the government will extend it, um, but runs up to the end of March next year. But it is something there for uh, you to uh, sign up for and just get benefit from other people who have been there, uh, have gone through it, have learned a lot of lessons, are still learning them, uh, and no doubt will learn 
from your schools when they sign up to it. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much, James, and for, for coping with the technical difficulties. Very ironic that we're on our leveraging technology presentation um, when we're having these issues. Um, Dean, we're going to hand over to you now. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to play your video, but if you can talk to the slides anyway, if that's OK. So thank you. So hello, my name is <clears throat> Dean Lindsay. Um, I'm just going to give a presentation on how um, 8 by have been helping companies um, leverage technology in schools and leveraging technology overall. I'm a customer marketing manager um, for the EM EMEA region. I just wanted to give a, before beginning, I'm um, just give a brief overview um, of primary and secondary schools um, as a whole, um, when talking about staff and pupils, currently accounted for 16% of the UK population. Um, as a pandemic struck and schools had to close, it therefore had a significant impact on the number of people in its sector who had to respond quickly and effectively to ensure education could continue. Um, next slide, please. Did you want to skip that slide as well, Dean? Sorry, I'm there, yeah. Apologies. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, one back, please. I was on the correct one. So I wanted to discuss on how we supported a school, um, Warminster School in Wiltshire, um, to rapidly ensure they could continue um, teaching remotely in a secure, safe and seamless way. Technology only had, um, had to be de deployed quickly, um, but both staff and pupils needed to be brought up to speed and trained on how to use technology. So although you know, putting it in place is one thing, um, I guess being able to use it and use it effectively is another, um, which is equally as important. Um, so it's important when you're putting this technology in place that you have the correct infrastructure to be able to train both pupils and teachers to be able to use it effectively and get the most out of it. Um, the video um, went on to basically show, I'll just give a brief overview of the video before moving on. Um, is that it discussed and showed how it was able to teach pupils remotely. Um, I know it was mentioned earlier as well, record those sessions, be able to share those with both pupils and students and to be able to interact and engage with them. Um, so it was a real positive um, way of being quick, agile um, and secure. Um, I know Security is obviously a big, big thing. Um, there were some issues um, in regards to security. So security is a big, big thing as well. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 crisis accelerated the pace of digital transformation among companies of all shapes and sizes. And education wasn't um, an exception. As decision makers rallied to find digital solutions to meet changing requirements despite underlying legacy challenges, while the immediate focus was to limit human contact at a social and economic loss, operating in the new normal means extra pressure on IT in the years to come. Public sector bodies need to continue educating students seamlessly. Next slide, please. The lack of infrastructure to support online teaching resulted in many teachers feeling initially unprepared to deliver teaching remotely. We were not only able to support schools, but we were also able to support them quickly, which was critical to continue education at all ages. Although face-to-face -face teaching cannot be replicated, the pandemic has highlighted that it can be used as an alternative option for some learning throughout an, an academic year. So although a lot of these things were in place, they obviously weren't being actively used. That has accelerated that in terms of being able to have it as a backup and as a, I guess, a, a new way of a hybrid way of teaching to have it there as an additional option. Next slide, please. As a result, education has changed dramatically with the distinctive rise of e-learning, whereby teaching is undertaken remotely on digital platforms. 
research suggests that online learning has been shown to increase retention of information and take less time, meaning the changes coronavirus has caused might be here to stay. For future learning with careful planning and consideration, video conferencing tools such as 8x8, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams and Zooms can help schools to provide education, support students in their learning and create a hybrid learning environment. As with everything, technology changes how we learn and how to take in information for all organisations, including education, which need to adapt to stay ahead. I think it was mentioned earlier as well. I think one great thing is that being able to record these teaching um, lessons and share them um, is, is, is enabling um, students to be able to retain that information, go at their own speed, go over it again, to, uh, again, as mentioned earlier, to retain that information. Thank you for your time. Um, so if you, I uh, hope you enjoyed um, the slides there on how um, 8 by 8 have helped um, schools leave with technology. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, I do have a question to kick us off. Um, just thinking about what technology that's maybe not currently mainstream, do you see becoming more common commonplace in the future? So I think that would be, I guess, a way where we can show, almost have a hybrid um, classroom. So some students at home, some students in the classroom with an interactive board mm -hmm. um, and interactive learning on that board. So bringing in um, questions on the board where pupils that are at home can um, answer questions such as a poll. So not only are you getting, you're getting students answering at home as well as those in the classroom live. So I think that that, almost bringing that hybrid um, feeling together in terms of an interactive screen. Um, I, th I think that's um, how technology will um, move learning forward in the not too distant future. Excellent. Did you have anything to add on that one, James, whether there's any other tech that we should be thinking about for the future, future, future proofing our schools? I, I, I think for schools that are already one-to-one, -one, you, 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 you'll see, Dean, that they're actually doing that already, which is really quite fascinating, is, is that children who've got devices can you, know, you you get that level of interaction you've got schools that are doing uh very quick assessments on where our children where are children at the moment and sharing that data in the back end and i think the the data piece is going to get really interesting the use yeah. of some of these adaptive adaptive learning tools ai sitting behind it and starting to inform um or help help inform schools of where they may need to look I won't, we'll never get away from that understanding of the whole child and the whole class, but it will help point you in directions that you may not have thought of going to. And I think that's a really interesting piece. Um, there's always been a lot of talk of virtual reality and augmented reality. I think that's more for the, the college sector than, than, than the school sector at the moment, um, mainly because I'm always concerned that it takes so long to get the equipment out that your learning is limited. But I think you know, the, that... Um, that move to the hybrid learning where some are at home in school, the use of devices where you can get much more uh, understanding of where children are at and uh, will be where I see most uh, work going. And then the, the AI type of tools where it's supporting people make decisions. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, beyond providing devices for pupils who cannot otherwise access them at home, how do you envision schools support pupils and families with regards to technology? Um, a lot of talk about the digital divide, but it's, you know, how, how else? I, I, I think the challenge you've got with the digital divide is, 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 is sort of multifaceted. One of them is about access to devices. And the, the DFE provided a lot of devices over the last 18 months, not necessarily enough for some schools and they may feel they've missed out. I think it's how you manage your budget uh, and what you do with things like people premium. Uh, that has an impact on staffing and I'm aware of that, but it, you know, it's, it's looking quite hard at where, where you're best spending money. Uh, it might be how you look at other things that you've got in school. Um, there is also the impact of some children just simply ha don't have a space or the environment to learn at home. Uh, and, and I think for, we, we, we can't get away from that. And therefore schools that offer extended school days also help to get around that in that they are uh, enabling children to you know, either come in early because they run breakfast clubs where they can do learning or extending the school day afterwards that enables them to. I don't think it should be seen as a penalty though. 
uh, and you end up in this challenge of, you know, am I penalising children that they are staying in school longer to work rather than doing clubs? But there's a balance in there somewhere, but we can't not support those children who would benefit from it. We've got somebody agreeing, Phil, it's definitely more of a problem than with co of connectivity than the actual devices. And I think uh, this morning we can definitely agree with that. <laughs> agree with that. Um, I've got a question around using technology to improve the back office in schools, um, sometimes to help head of departments budget or just understand their budget, maybe. Is there any experience that you've, you've seen, Kathy, maybe or Neil, that, that you've seen where, where technology has been used to, to support head of departments in that way? Yeah, I think um, the thing, the move to better back office technology is prob probably one of the key changes we'll see in the sector, particularly as multi-academy trusts grow. I mean, few trusts at the moment are the size of, of James's at United Learning, but um, on average, they, they're getting a lot bigger. And there, um, that brings a lot of challenges where you've got staff spread across multiple schools and some staff shared between schools. And that uh, having tech which supports that rather than hinders it is really vital to growth. I think the point I'd pick up on here is something that James said about having a digital strategy. And as governors, this is the thing to do. Focus on a digital strategy for your school or multi-academy trust. Um, which looks to this long term and works out how to have um, technology rolled out throughout the school or trust, supporting things like this. So, you know, is your MIS uh, cloud-based? Is your MIS consistent across all schools? Uh, is your billing system, your payroll system, all of these sort of bits of technology um, consistent across your school or trust? And also then, uh, applicable and fitting into a long-term digital strategy. But I think too much tech in schools has just grow, grown on organically. You know, one bit of tech over here, one bit of tech over here, a bit of software, let's use this in this school, let's use that in that school. And you look at it and you think, well, this is this is um, a, a complete um, range of options. What we need to do now as a sector is focus on a strategy that works for our school or, or trust and plan for that. And I think that's sort of where we are as a overall sector at the moment is thinking strategically and planning this out correctly. Excellent, thank you. Kathy, did you have anything to add on that? Is there anything that you've got in your strategy for the, for the future that you'd like to share? I think maybe Kathy's frozen actually. Okay. Well, um, we are nearing the end now, so we, we've just got a couple more minutes. Um, let me just have a quick check. Um, I've got a question around flow integration in Microsoft Teams for calibrating in strategic planning. Uh, a question for Neil. I don't know if there's anything anyone. Yes, so I think so. I think uh, yeah. So Microsoft Flow, as I understand, is a, it's a way of um, automating tech um, and so this thing happens and then an email is is triggered or a message is triggered and that can be used very effectively I think within uh, across schools and um, uh, and trusts but again I come back to the other point you know it's it's one of those texts oh this looks interesting let's do this it's only you only really get the benefits of that sort of technology when it's consistent across all departments in or uh, all schools and it's done as part of an overall strategy so you know, um, what you've got in a lot of trusts is um, teams used in some schools, Google Classroom used in others, and nothing used in others. And that's the problem to solve first, get mm -hmm. that consistency as part of an overall strategy, and then, and then think, okay, now what is the solution to um, improving workflow between um, uh, staff or between the uh, senior leadership team and governors, for example, those mm -hmm. things. So yeah, I'd, so I appreciate that's not a direct answer to the question on flow, but I think generally do it as part of a strategy. Thank you. I see James has got his hand up. We're, we're right on nine o'clock, James. So just, just to quickly over to you and then, then we'll finish up. Yeah, I, I would say that I, I agree wholeheartedly with Neil on that consistency on, on core platforms. Uh, and there are a number of demonstrators using flow and Google's equivalent to streamline processes such as um, uh, a way of uh, Pupil away, I can't remember the name is now, but get, you know, when, when people are going out of school or for booking leave and those sorts of things. So there are ways of using it. But if you're trying to do it across a whole trust, you want consistency and you also need to have some control of it. Because when the person who leaves set it up, you need to know how it was done. Uh, otherwise, you end up with a bit of a, a, an odd legacy. 
Thank you ever so much. Um, thank you ever so much to all of our panelists. Thank you to all of the attendees for bearing with us with our technical problems. We will share all of the slides and the video uh, from Dean with you following uh, following the session. So that will all come to you. Um, we've got a couple more sessions, which if you're interested in, in sort of technology might be of interest over the course of the conference. On Thursday, we've got a session with PwC um, about cybersecurity essentials. And on Friday, we have got a session at eight o'clock around remote governance and your board. So please do sign up for either of those if you, you have further thoughts or questions um, in those areas. As I said, thank you ever so much for joining us. And I do wish you a very good day uh, going forward. Bye bye.